Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to my channel. So Rahu Ketu, part four or five, and now I forget everything. Rahu Ketu. Another one thing I want you to remember when you speak of Rahu Ketu: unorthodoxy, out of the box, unconventional, maverick kind of energy. Both of these, Rahu and Ketu. One wants to do it in a detached kind of way, one wants to do it in an attached kind of way. It's just the polar opposite of the same string. They fall on the same axis, right? And this unorthodoxy, this doing things which is out of tradition, which is out of the mainstream, thinking in terms of new unconventional ways, Aquarian kind of energy, really speaking, Rahu and Ketu, is what this next one is about because we are talking about Purva Bhadrapada. I was just sitting outside, I went for a walk in the morning and came back. And now it is pouring rains outside, uh, asking, this is the sign of Rudra. So I said, give me a sign. There's the sign. It's a summer, it's not supposed to rain here. So this is the Rudra energy. When it falls in Purva Bhadrapada, in Aquarius, right? As Aquarian as it can get. Well, at least the last three Padas. But anyway. So I want you to remember this because I'm going to add one more layer from this video onwards to the entire series because what I'm making and what this channel is about and this content of this channel is for youngsters, the youth who are born in the shift, everyone who is born after 1987 on this planet, wherever you are, whichever country you are, whatever you believe or not believe in. It belongs to humanity. It's not about one person or it's not about Indians. Okay, it's about everyone. Because in this shift, like I said in the previous videos, we are moving towards a more accepting, more nurturing, more caring, more collaborative, compassionate, feminine energies. So I'm trying to bring a bridge, a gap here between the tradition. Tradition does not have to go away. It just has to recalibrate to a newer form. That's how we rebuild the whole concepts. That's how we build new science. That's how we build new acceptance. Rejuvenate the institutions. Rejuvenate earth. Right? What about the earth? What about all this? Skin and bones. This is earth. Everything is earth. So I want to bring it to the youngsters. I couldn't care about the old cynical crackpots. Seriously. All those people who come and dislike my videos. Good. Thanks. You give me more inspiration. So... This is for the youngsters. So I'm going to add one more layer from this video onwards of who in this shift is born with this Rahu in Purva Bhadrapada. I'm going to add that for every one of the upcoming videos. So keep watching. And uh, if you have already seen the middle portion where I give introduction to what is Rahu, what is Ketu, what am I yammering on about, you have to watch that. But if you already seen that, skip it to the pie chart. Okay. And be awesome wherever you are. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not this, you're not that. They just lose in the head. Don't listen to people like that. Don't need to listen to damaged crackpots nonsense, okay? It's just not worth your time. So number one, the classical characteristics of Rahu and Ketu as described by the classical Vedic literature. Okay, what is Rahu and Ketu? These are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun so basically if you take two eclipses ellipses it will form two intersection points yeah so these two intersection points are called the north node and the south node they are virtual nodes although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute so who is rahu the symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe right this is typically how it is portrayed in western astrology so i'm using the same symbol here rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable hunger and appetite be it sensual or physical yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it rahu is the one who constantly wants something think of it as a live head only not the body okay so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach okay? just a head which is alive this gives rahu the title of bhogakaraka 
or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why so it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something it wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next this is why varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in why because of that insatiable hunger there is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it that's rahu Ketu, on the other hand, is mythologically depicted as the severe body, the remaining half of the demon, symbolizing constant, endless, insatiable search for identity. It is looking for the head, but it doesn't have a head. So it is looking for that identity. Everybody's identity, ego, is centered in the head, what you look like, right? It is also seeking for true purpose, sense of self. As a result of this, it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands ketu has got hands it's trying to hold on to everything but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head it's like trying to grasp on to everything thinking oh i want this or i am this i am that i am this not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there since it has arms and walks everywhere it goes around through life walking from place to place people situation circumstances but not knowing who or what it is it doesn't have a head this is why ketu is referred to as mokshakaraka or the seeker's path the one energy in us which seeks something that's why ketu is called the mokshakaraka now this is the classical interpretation okay now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation very important to connect the bridges now here you have the rahu ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation this i have borrowed from the book a light on life by robert sova excellent book i have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it i seriously suggest that okay the north node of the moon rahu what does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts what does rahu lead to in the modern context rahu is responsible for originality individuality independence insight ingenuity inspiration and imagination on the positive side because rahu and ketu both love to explore foreign stuff things out of the box things not taught by tradition rahu and ketu will be anything but traditional okay think of it as something foreign to the culture to the way you are taught things looking for original stuff if there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing so to speak thinking out of the box it is this that's why it's important to pay attention to this okay back to this so rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion escapism neurosis psychosis deception addiction vagueness illusion and del- delusion this is the downside now how this plays out and why we like to see individually in the charts we will just will see that okay ketu ketu the guy with only the body no head there is gives us the feeling of universality impressionability idealism intuition compassion spirituality self sacrifice subtleness on the positive side on the down side it can lead to eccentricity fanaticism explosiveness violence unconventionality amorality iconoclasm impulsiveness and emotional tensions this is on the down side this is what it plays out and rahu ketu is typically an axis like we shown over there right rahu ketu let me remove myself for the time being from that axis okay there you are so you see it as an axis okay 180 degrees apart and it can play out in any one of the opposite houses it can play out in 172 8 3 9 4 10 etc etc it can be you'll see that later but this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life in your different houses are you looking for these two aspects and they are always opposite to each other as you can see okay to stand opposite to each other so if it plays out in second house 
it detaches itself from the eighth house. If Rahu is in the second house, it, Ketu will be in the eighth house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the eighth house aspect with these aspects shown here, second house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition. And what's the story on this? Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor and the lunar aspect is the nakshatra which gives the entire characteristics in the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay? The solar or the dispositor means since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own. Remember it's a virtual node. It is not a planet. They both do not have any planetary characteristic individually. So they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in. Suppose Mercury is in the third house. okay, And Rahu sits in the house of Mercury somewhere else. So it will borrow the attributes of Mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever Rahu is sitting in. Got it? Nakshatras. Since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own, individually they take on the shade of personality. Nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality. It's coloring of a personality. It's seeing the world through different colored glasses. That they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities. So Rahu and Ketu do two things at the same time. At the solar level, it goes with the dispositor, that is all of the planets, physical planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Sun, Moon, so on. So they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting. If it sits in Rahu sits in Cancer, it will you have to look for where Moon is sitting, which house, and what it is doing there, and even the Moon Nakshatra. If it is sitting in Leo, Rahu in Leo, that means it will you have to look for where Sun is sitting and which Nakshatra and which house. So it will bring those attributes. That's the way you have to analyze this. Okay. Let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why. Now there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating Rahu and Ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self-development to understand where they are coming from. If you're not interested in changing yourself, this entire channel is useless for you. But if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life, where do I need to go, what are my talents, and you question these kinds of things, excuse the noise somebody is drilling about, so then you need to understand these aspects. Now that's the typical chart, Indian chart, and house numbers are depicted as 1, 2, 3, 4, up till 12. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is there. And I have stuck Rahu Ketu as possible axis on the 1, 7. That is Aries and Libra. That is the top and the bottom. So either it can go to house number 1 or 7. Rahu Ketu can be reversed. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Or in 4 and 10. Now 1, 4, 7 and 10 in Vedic Astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are. That define how you operate in life, throughout life. So these become crucial. Why? The 1-7 axis effects, if Rahu and Ketu fall on there, has a direct effect on yourself and other concept. 1 and 7 is self and other. How you re relate to yourself and how you relate, look at the world around you as others, including the spouse, because 7th house is the house of the spouse, but also others. So how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others. So it defines who you are in a very broad sense. One seven axis of Rahu Ketu. The four ten on the other hand, fourth house being the house of the mother, tenth being father, fourth being home, tenth being career. You see, this has a you know all kinds of implications, which define who you are. The four ten axis has effects on the heart versus mind. Mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and 
being used in the career right you dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world heart is your home your home center where you feel comfortable home is where the heart is that kind of a thing so heart and home is affected by this rahu ketu axis again rahu and ketu might be reversed rahu might be in the fourth ketu might be in the tenth or vice versa same way with one and seven but these are the vital relating aspects of rahu and ketu now what about the rest of the houses now rest of the houses are called trikona or kona in sanskrit right these are the things that come and go in your life let be second house third house fifth house sixth eighth ninth eleventh the twelfth these are the things that come and go in our life through life through your entire life these are things that are added into subtracted from us but this is not us one four seven and ten is us everything else is secondary which revolves around you as life comes and goes all other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life that's all it is they are less significant in terms of rahu and ketu when compared to 1 7 4 and 10 axis of rahu and ketu please remember this when you evaluating you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others rahu is attachment ketu is detachment rahu is expansion ketu is reduction and they stand opposite to each other all this right now let's take the cases one by one so let's see now now we come to the rahu ketu axis you see that pie chart over there we are over aquarius purva bhadra pada is as aquarius as it can get and rahu is sitting there and purva bhadra pada is ruled by ajayika eka pada if you don't know what i mean just see my 27 nakshatra playlist means it is the one legged fire dragon so it's a fiery transformative nakshatra and it falls within aquarius which is all about others and it falls in manushya gana which is purva bhadra pada this axis i'm going to go fast so catch up okay so this axis falls between uttara falguni purva falguni and purva bhadra pada you got to understand all these uttara and purva business is all about manushya gana meaning they are all about human challenges they are not so much concerned about spiritual stuff they are not concerned about conceptual stuff they are having the real struggles of real life manushya gana people are trying to understand how do i solve these problems in my life how do i pay the bills how do i educate the kids how do i go make a difference in the workplace etc etc so all these purva and uttara are all manushya ganas so manushya gana first of all you got to understand they will be intently focused on the earthly aspects of things and which is required obviously who will be interested in this axis people born in 1988 people who are of 35 years of age now today in 2023 have this rahu in purva bhadra pada pay attention to this another one is one who are born in 2007 one who are 16 years of age now sweet 16 all the sweet 16s of the planet have rahu in purva bhadra pada now next one will be by the way in 2025 people yet to be born so pay attention to this all 35 year olds and all 16 year olds <clears throat> this is what you are dealing with okay we are trying to uncover what ways we can uncover this challenge called purva bhadra pada and rudra is very misunderstood rudra is called ajayika ek pada in this think of one person with one feet who has one feet it's like the nataraja it's like the shiva who's dancing he dances on one feet as it's depicted what else has actually one feet in the creation all the trees rudra is responsible for maintaining and sustaining all the earth all the plants and trees are attributed to rudra if you don't know what i mean just read up rudra prashna you'll know what i mean okay back to i digress so the first one we are going to address is the cancer capricorn in the namamsha okay so first off start from the beginning if you are talking about rahu ketu you got to see the dispositor in this case the dispositor of rahu is saturn and rahu as well so this becomes a strongly rahu signal both shatabhisha and purva bhadra pada if rahu is situated there it rules their house by default aquarius is ruled by saturn and rahu together 
In Western astrology, they compare Putin throwing Uranus also. Yes, which is accurate. Maybe later on I will do something with Uranus in Nakshatra aspect. That's a totally different thing. So we are talking unconventional mavericks who want to do things for others, who are trying to recreate fire dragon. Is think, think of it like a phoenix. You know, we have very famous phoenix. The one who is born out of the ashes, rises from the ashes and want to recreate again. This is the Rudra. This is the power of Rudra. Rahu being there, an unconventional one, and in his own sign of Aquarius, is extremely strong. That's why I spent some time doing, just saying what I said, right? You need to start thinking unconvention. Yes, agreed. Very good to bring out new stuff. Very good to be, be yourself as in Maverick. Very good. Hats off to you guys. But you need to understand the energy and that's what let's look into. First you look at Saturn, where Saturn is placed. Right opposite to Saturn, where it is placed is what Saturn wants to accomplish in your life. Seventh house, okay, maximum power of Saturn. That's what you would want to look at when Rahu is in Padrapada. And it wants to transform things from the difficulties of life. Look at the themes of Purva Bhadrapada. It wants to transform things. This is highly inclined towards that. Now Ketu on the other axis is sitting in Capricorn. Right? And it is in Uttara Falguni. Sorry, not Capricorn. What's that? Virgo. My brain is in a tailspin today. So, it is sitting in Uttara Falguni in the second pala which is what let's see the white arrow there okay so first you got to look at ketu is falling in leo or oh, sorry in virgo so you got to look at mercury so you are talking the axis of mercury and saturn and rahu mercury is what relationship with saturn it is neutral to saturn right Saturn is what relation to Mercury? It is a friend of Mercury. So these, this axis works well if you use your head, if you use your logic and reasoning. Think of Ketu and Rahu as Ketu wants to go towards Rahu. The way you bridge this is whatever energy you bring in from past lives, you got to move towards Rahu. Okay. So it goes from the Moksha house. As you can see, Pisces to Cancer, water to water, and it goes from Virgo to Capricorn, very earthly. On the one hand, you bring in all the earthly energies. On the other hand, you want to go towards the emotional satisfaction of things. This is the first axis, and you want to look at dispositors in each case. In the case of Ketu, it will be Mercury in the birth chart, and it will be Jupiter in the birth chart. The, we are talking just about the Moksha Pada here because it goes into Pisces, right? Now let's see the next one. Now we go to the second, third Pada. The third Pada of Purva Bhadra Pada where Rahu is sitting. We, we are shifting the Rahu axis. So the third Pada of Purva Bhadra Pada is Aquarius going into Gemini. So it's a very airy sign. This person is all about the mental stuff. They are sorting out new concepts in an unconventional ways. They could become inventors. They could be doing things for the masses which is very unconventional and different in ideas. They could be writers. And Ketu on the other hand, what are they bringing in? Ketu brings it towards Rahul. So Ketu is sitting in Dharmapada of Leo. So there is the fiery energy of past life leadership. Leo going into Sagittarius, so very fire air bringing it to very air, airy sign. Essentially, what this tells me again, you got to look at where the dispositors are, right? These people would want to bring in new ideas, they have had leadership in their past life, and now they want to bring it for the masses. Aquarius is all about masses, always. Okay, keep that in mind when we go forward. Let us see the second pada. In the second pada, now we land in the Taurus Scorpio. Taurus to Scorpio in Navamsha, that bracket, right? So we again go into Artha Moksha. If you are astute, you are following, if you are following this, if you are seeing the entire video at all, you will notice that always Artha goes into Moksha in one way for Rahu Ketu or the other way around, Moksha to Artha. And it goes from Kama to Dharma and Dharma to Kama. You notice this? There is a rhythm to this whole thing. 
So anyway, coming back to Aquarius. Now it's in sign of Aquarius. So dispositor being Saturn. Okay. You got to watch where Saturn is. And Saturn always wants to accomplish what's directly in front of it. The seventh aspect. The house of that. Whatever the nature is. And in Purva Falguni. Now we've got a Purva Falguni. What's the Purva Falguni aspect? Purva Falguni is what good deeds you get from the past birth. That's why it's called Purva before. Falguni is fruits of your labor. Good deeds from the past life. Endowed with beauty, fame, creativity. All these things are Purva Falguni. Most of this Hollywood and Bollywood actor actresses are all called Purva Falguni very prominent. They have lots of love affairs. They have lots of extramarital affairs. All kinds of things. You can see every one of these actor actresses have that, right? So it's got a theme of fame in the name and as well as lots of relationship, they're seeking love. In the Moksha Pada, it goes into Scorpio, which is very intense and it wants to bring it in the Vamsha, Aquarius going into Taurus. So earth transformation to earth from air, transformation from um, Leo, fiery leadership, which it has brought from past life into intense emotions. This can get very intensely um, seeking love and seeking bonding in later stages of life again depends upon where the dispositor sits in this case Scorpio will be Mars and Taurus in Navamsha will be Venus so you're talking about the Venus Mars push and pull in the Navamsha you got to see where they are placed then you'll make out what is the drive here specific drive so it is the first pada now so in the first Pada, Rahu is touching Aquarius, look for the dispositor, which is uh, Saturn and see the themes of Purvapadra Pada also, you will get this better there, the Padas basically. Somebody is asking me one of the comments, what are the Padas, can you tell more about Padas? Here you go buddy. So, and it goes in Navamsha in Aries, so air transforming to fire and uh, Ketu counterpart which provides it energy is Leo going into Libra, that is fire going into air. Air going into fire and fire going into air. So it's a sort of flip. These kind of people might flip later on in life and change their ideology completely, inside out. This is what we saw in one previous one also, right? Pisces going into Virgo and Virgo going into Pisces is what I'm getting. So this is how it transforms through life. Okay. As always, see the dispositor, see which house the dispositor is following in, see the nakshatra of the dispositor. In this case, you have to see even what nakshatra Saturn is sitting in. It might be sitting in some other house and in some other nakshatra of its own. So you have to see the themes of that nakshatra. And Saturn always wants to bring things for others. It's about for the masses. That is why it is exalted very highly, Mool Trikon in Aquarius. It loves to do for the masses. This is what you need to see where Saturn wants to play. And it wants to do it in a very grounded manner, by the way. On the other hand, Mercury is providing the intellect. Here, Leo is providing the leadership. Sun is providing that ego that is needed. If you're going to go and stand in front of a stadium or if you're a politician or a leader of a country, you need to speak to everybody and address everyone. Imagine the charisma and the power you need for such a role. Think of that kind of a thing, this kind of an axis because it's very grounded okay next we shall see Shatabhisha again very interesting because still in Aquarius and we are in a very Aquarian new energy okay you know take care be safe